the passionate instigator and dynamic problem solver, Dr. Kevin Ross Emery, the host of the Dr. Kevin Radio Show, will be taking you outside the box, behind the curtain, and identifying the load of BS we are fed every day. And now, Dr. Kevin. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Dr. Kevin Show, where we challenge everything and everyone. And this week is our first uh, Thursday of the month. It used to be first quenching Thursday with Matt Connerton from IPM Nation uh, and Matt Connerton Unleashed. But we have changed that over. If this is the first Thursday you've joined us in a while, you will now find that this is now called... Our, our first Thursday month is called Neutral News. And Neutral News is we're trying to see if we can actually just bring you some facts, just the facts, as they used to say in Dragnet. Um, just a fact, ma'am. And to help you be able to make better informed decisions. We're trying to strip, strip away the hype, the agenda, and the lies. Because, you know, there's hype and there's agenda, and then there's just right out lies. And, you know, the lies are just getting bigger and bigger. Pretty soon we will be have a, uh, we will have something that looks like a land bridge from Washington, D.C. to London. And it will just be President Trump's nose. Um, oh, my. Pinocchio fairy tale be true. Uh, if you wish to participate in today's conversation, you may do so by calling in at 202-570-7057. That's 202-570-7057. Uh, or you can come to facebook.com backslash mydrkevin, M-Y-D-R-K-E-V-I-N. Make sure you like my page when you're here, because um, I am a likable guy. And now I'm going to bring on none other than the... The famously minted celebrity, Matt Connerton. Hello, Matt. Hello. And I'd just like to say, by the way, even though this isn't Thirst Quenching Thursday anymore, I still do get awfully parched. Do you? Well, you may need to have more drinks around you then. Of what variety, <laughs> I'm not going to comment. Um, yeah. So... Uh, did you get a chance to look at the new write-up I did for this? Because they were still posting, my fault, not the stations, they were still posting Thirst Quenching Thursday to announce this show. And so I did a rewrite last week. Did you get a chance to look at it? I saw the one you just you just shared out. I just saw one pop up a few minutes ago. Are you talking about that one, or was this a different yep. one? That's the new write-up. I haven't had a chance to do a meme or whatever, but see? I'm not too yeah. far behind yeah. the eight ball. Right. No, I just saw it. It's great. So, um, so, and before we get into our neutral news, uh, what's up on your side of the world these days? Well, Dr. Kevin, actually, this will be my first time uh, revealing this on your program, but beginning Monday, this coming Monday, uh, I will be doing Unleashed in the Afternoon with Matt Connerton live on WMNH 95.3, right here in uh, glorious Manchester, New Hampshire. And, of course, uh, people will be able to listen online as well at uh, WMNHFM.org. And I hope that people do because I will be uh, – well, obviously, I hope people listen. But uh, I'll be um, uh, discussing politics on that program. Oh, I'm sorry. I gave the wrong web address. Boy, i got to correct that. It's actually WMNHradio.org. i to make sure I've got that right. But uh, I'll be discussing politics, and, you know, I'll do a little bit of state and local, but it's going to be mostly national politics. Uh, so it's my, it's my first time, you know, I, obviously I do a lot of political programming, and I have some experience in FM radio, terrestrial radio, but this will be my first time doing a primarily political program on FM radio. So uh, I'm very excited. So that's launching this coming Monday. And, uh, again, it's uh, weekdays, 4 to 6 p.m., afternoon drive on WMNH 95.3. And, uh, like I said, people can listen online, too, WMNHradio.org. Well, I'm going to have you at some point, either now or when we're on our first break, write that in the comment section under today's show to, you know, invite people to come join you. Because Absolutely. if they're not, uh, you know, on the radio in Manchester, the greater Manchester, New Hampshire area, they can tune in via the one and only internet. 
So yes, make yes. sure you get all that information up under the post line. Um, congratulations, I think that's fabulous. Thank you, um, I'm very excited, yes. And so, now does that mean that you're going to get off the air at six o'clock and be back on the air on uh, the first Thursday of every month with me at 6.02? Yeah, I don't think it'll be a problem. Okay. Well, you know, if you're a couple minutes late, site, late, I can just say nasty things about you until you get on air. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, you know. Um, so there is lots of stuff going on today and lots of stuff going on around. And we briefly texted before. Um, and you said that you were ready for tonight's show. So what have you got up that sleeve of yours? What, 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 what would you like to share and bring a neutral light to? Well, uh, one of the things, and, you know, Dr. Kevin, I may have discussed this on your show before, but certainly not uh, with this new uh, format. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the debt ceiling or the debt limit, federal debt limit, borrowing limit. Uh, it's got a, a few different terms that, that people – uh, bandy about, uh, but it is in the news right now, and it's uh, the reason I think it's important, aside from the fact that it is something that affects all of us, whether people realize it or not, but there are incredible misconceptions about what the uh, debt ceiling actually is and how it works, because um, a lot of people, if you talk to them, uh, they think the debt ceiling is the same thing as the federal budget, and it's not. And um, some people will oppose raising the debt ceiling uh, because they're they're of the belief that, well, you know, the federal government spends too much money, et cetera. And, you know, I mean, whether that's true or not is, is a matter of opinion. Uh, but in terms of, of just the facts of this, because I know the idea with this is, you know, we're discussing the facts. The fact is the, the debt ceiling or the borrowing limit is how much money uh, or the limit on how much money the federal government can borrow to pay off debt that it's already incurred. And this has, um, throughout our history, uh, we have never not raised the debt limit on schedule, uh, because regardless of, of who was in charge, whether it was a Republican or, or a Democratic president, um, because – if you don't raise the debt limit itself and we go into default, uh, that would be the first time actually in the history of our country that the United States, which economists generally consider to be the bedrock of the global economy, that will be the first time uh, that we have ever defaulted on our debt. And this is very important because, like I said, there are misconceptions. And um, I dare say I think there are people – within the United States Congress who don't fully understand what the debt limit or the debt ceiling is. Um, so that's, that's um, I know we're probably coming up on a break in a couple of minutes, but I mean, that, that's something that I wanted to, to kind of talk about is um, just explaining to people what it is and how it's not the same thing as the budget. The budget is obviously, well, you know, we all know what the, what the budget is. It's, it's how much money is, earmarked for this and that and, you know, military spending, entitlements, all of that. But the debt limit is how much money you can borrow to pay for the debt that you've already incurred. Um, and that is why it is so important. It's, it's, and I, the way I like to explain it to people is think about, you know, if you have a bill that comes due, maybe your electric bill is due, but you didn't budget out properly for that electric bill. So you could default on the bill and not pay it, but then you risk having your electricity shut off. So instead, you know, maybe you borrow money from someone or maybe you call your credit card company and ask them to increase your limit if you're in good standing. So then you have enough on your credit card to pay the bill to get you by for this month or whatever it may be. Think of it as that and think of what the consequence, the potential consequence is of uh, not raising or, or not raising that money, whether it be through borrowing or, or an increased uh, limit on your credit card, et cetera. Think of what the consequence of that is of defaulting on that bill. And that's, that's, so that's kind of a real world way of explaining it because obviously, you know, when you're talking about trillions of dollars, 
it, it becomes difficult to think of it in a real world way because that the numbers are so sort of otherworldly. Uh, and, and plus, I think, too, Americans are sort of desensitized in a way to those uh, very large otherworldly numbers because we're so used to hearing about the debt and the deficit, et cetera. And some people, too, don't realize the difference between the debt and the deficit. You know, the, the deficit is what is your annual shortfall in the federal budget, um, you know, what you've budgeted versus what's coming in uh, via taxes. And, of course, the, the debt is how much money is actually owed. And, of course, the debt is constantly increasing whether, whether or not we're operating under a deficit or a surplus in terms of the budget. But I think it's important for, um, and I don't know if you want me to go any deeper with it on the other side of the break or not, but, or if you want to shift gears, but I think it's important that people understand the difference between these things. And I think that helping people understand that helps them to understand why the debt limit is so important and why almost any economist will tell you, uh, you know, and there's all kinds of different economic theory, but economists generally agree you have to raise the debt ceiling uh, on schedule because the United States government must never be allowed uh, to default. Okay. All right. Uh, so Dr. Kev, I, I don't know. I don't know if uh, Dr. Kevin is muted. Uh, I don't know if he's having technical issues. It did kind of sound like he was underwater uh, during much of that first segment, but uh, welcome to the Dr. Kevin show. <laughs> and we are, uh, we're going to a break. And when we come back, hopefully Dr. Kevin will be with us here on Ohm Times Radio. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. Ohm Times. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. Looking for inspiration? Want to be inspired? Not sure where to go. Find Mark and Kim every Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern on Inspired Living. Topics will elevate consciousness and range from metaphysics to the human and social experience and all things spiritual. Welcome to an inspired community that offers support, encouragement, and new ways of thinking. You are, you are the, inspired the inspired and, and the inspiration. inspiration. Mother, Mother Ocean. Hi, I'm Jimmy Buffett. West Indian manatees are one of the most unique animals on earth, and we're still finding out so many new things about them. But manatees are endangered and many of them are killed or injured each year because of watercraft collisions or other human activities. You can help save these gentle marine mammals. For free tips on what you can do, call Save the Manatee Club at 1-800-432-JOIN. Thank you. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Dr. Kevin Show, uh, where we're changing the world one ohm at a time here on Ohm Times Radio. And here on the Dr. Kevin Show, we like to challenge everything and everyone. Uh, we were having a little technical difficulty before. Um, Matt, are you there? I am. Oh, good, good. Um, I heard <laughs> stuff breaking up. But I couldn't tell if it was you or me, and then suddenly I realized, like, we should be on break, and I'm not hearing anything, and I didn't know what happened. So you oh. were talking about the – you. I don't know. Maybe it's all the stormy weather. I'm just sitting here right in a place I've sat before, hooked to the Internet, so I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe, maybe you broke it. Did you break the show? Did I break the show? I don't know. Maybe I broke the show. Mm -hmm. maybe. I guess I could have. Yeah. Um, so anyways, 
So you were talking about the debt ceiling and that Mm -hmm. if we now if we don't do the debt ceiling, if Mm -hmm. we don't um, do uh, pay that, what happens? What does that look like? Well, the interesting part about that is, and by the way, I should clarify something that I, I didn't mention in the first segment. We've actually already missed raising the debt limit, so the Treasury has had to resort to what they call extraordinary measures uh, to continue to pay uh, on on the debt under the assumption that Congress will vote to, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, will vote to raise the debt ceiling. And, and that has happened before where the limit, the deadline has actually been missed, but the Treasury Department was able to keep it going uh, in the interim until the uh, limit is officially raised. But the interesting thing about what happens if we don't do it is no one really knows for sure because it's never happened. But the assumption is um, that if we go into default, you know, because as I said, you know, the U.S. is considered the bedrock of the global economy. And um, I, again, I know, you know, I, I try to, I know we're trying to, to stay neutral with this and not inject our, our personal opinions. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid hyperbole, but I, I will go ahead and say that um, I like to use the phrase uh, global economic Armageddon uh, to describe uh, what would likely be the consequence of the United States for the first time in American history defaulting on our debt. Uh, de- defaulting on the full faith and credit of the United States. We've already had at least one downgrade where the uh, country's credit rating has been downgraded, and that in and of itself is very bad. Uh, it happened in 2011. Uh, 2011 was the first um, very serious and public uh, sort of um, wandering toward the cliff uh, that our government went through. I, and not, it, not the first time that the debt ceiling has ever been made an issue, but the first time it was ever made a serious issue where it appeared uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of Tea Partiers in Congress were, in fact, going to vote against raising the limit no matter what. And that's why I made the comment that I'm concerned that that we have people in the United States Congress voting on this without actually understanding the differences between the the debt ceiling, the the debt, the deficit, the budget. and that, you know, that, that concerns me. Uh, but, uh, but no one really knows exactly how the dominoes would fall if we were to default. But the general consensus among economists across the spectrum, because there are many different economic theories, uh, but the, the general consensus is that this must never be allowed to happen. Well, when I was talking, I guess, to no one, um, because I <laughs> thought I was talking to somebody, but it turned out I right. was not, um, <laughs> is uh, when I was talking to, to uh, when I was talking, I did the, um, if we can't pay off our debt, well, of course, you know, if you don't pay off your debt personally, then, you know, you have everything taken away from you and you lose everything and you can be pushed into dam- bankruptcy and stuff like this. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if maybe we should suspend the pay of all of our elected officials and that money should be going towards the debt until they can figure it out. Right. I mean, they are <laughs> responsible for it, right? They've They've been taking money in order to make sure that this country is okay uh that it's that that's it's, very yeah so i uh, mean quite right uh, but but obviously they would never do that and of course too um that in and of itself would not uh come anywhere near solving the problem i mean entitlements are, are the big thing entitlements military spending and by the way that's one of the things too that uh if these dominoes were to begin to fall Uh, The government then has to decide with what money it does have how to prioritize these things Um, and and would have to figure that out very quickly. So there's all kinds of uh, potentially uh, calamitous consequences. 
And that's and that's why that's why too I wanted to to uh, bring up this issue because, uh, like I said, not only do I feel that uh, a lot of people don't understand what the debt ceiling really is, but I also feel that it isn't. It, it's something that is so incredibly important. It is a an incredibly important issue. I mean, it's a as far as I'm concerned, it's a top five issue in this country. And yet, if you were to ask ask almost anyone, what are your top five political issues that you care most about? The death ceiling wouldn't even occur to most people because I don't think most people realize uh, how important it is and how much of a role it plays in the global economy. No, I would agree. Um, the scary part is that you're saying that you don't believe that a lot of our people in government that are making these decisions in of himself understand what it's about. And and let me ask Correct. you, because this is neutral news, what do you base that on? Is that just because of how they talk about it? Like, you can tell when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about by what they say, that clearly, you know, they're, they're not understanding, they're, there's something that, I mean, or is this a supposition? Where, where, where does that thought come from? Well, uh, what, I, what I've observed is people who oppose raising the debt ceiling will often say things like, well, the government spends too much money. We should curb that. Or it's about time we learn some financial discipline and whatnot. And when, when they and, – and, again, these, this doesn't come up only in conversations that I have with people, uh, you know, in, in my life. But, you know, you can turn on uh, cable news. And, and see conservative uh, Republican politicians who, who, are, who will oppose raising the debt ceiling and, and, and say things like that. And, and whenever I hear anyone say that, I, I immediately think, okay, this individual does not understand the difference between the debt ceiling and the budget. They think it's the same thing. And obviously it's not. I mean, they're related, but it's not the same thing. So when I hear... When this first became a major issue in 2011, like I said, that was the first time that we really flirted with economic disaster with this. Uh, there were Tea Party Republicans who would, who would pop up on cable news and they would say, look, it's about time we learn some fiscal discipline and, and whatnot. And it's like, OK, but that's but but in this context, it's kind of like saying you know, okay, I, I've got arthritis in, in, in my hand, so it's about time I just chop off my hand. And, you know, and and I and again, if someone said that to you, you what would you think? You would think, well, this person clearly doesn't understand uh, the consequences of the choices that they're making. And and so I I very much get the impression that some of these people we've elected literally don't understand what. Personally, I think is a relatively simple concept once explained to understand, and that's that's concerning. It is. It's very concerning, um, and they don't they don't get the action and consequence. Um, and we all know. I mean, this is this is a fact. You don't have to pass. You, you know, you, you don't have to score a certain amount on your IQ to get elected. <laughs> you don't have to pass a competency test to get elected. You don't even really have That's you don't right. have to pass a mentally competent test to get. If the if the American people say that they want you in, um, there are some things that would keep you out, but um, they're relatively few and far between. Oh, I mean, there's not a lot. That's right. And certainly intelligence is not one of them. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's just the truth. So, yeah, it, it, it's about marketing. Yeah, it's about marketing. Marketing always trumps competency. Yeah. So my next question is, so is, is, do you think, now this is a think question, so, but I want to, mm -hmm. and I want to get back to the, the essence of, of neutral news which we have a break in two minutes. And we'll, when we get back, I want to start on another topic. Um, but do you think that stupidity will, will, will 
implode this country financially? No, I don't. Uh, I don't foresee, you know, because anyone who is who is a politician ultimately uh, needs to do or will do um, what is going to get them reelected and completely sabotaging the uh, global economy, I would think, would have uh, negative consequences towards someone's prospect of serving another term. So, no, but what, but what we do see now, and we started to see it in 2011 for the first time really heavily, is this issue being used as a bargaining chip. Mitch McConnell in 2011 uh, infamously said that he felt that the debt ceiling was a hostage worth taking, meaning it's perfectly acceptable to use it as a bargaining chip when negotiating the budget. Um, and there is a risk to that. And that has become the pattern since then. It is now used as a bargaining chip. And that is an irresponsible use because they don't understand what they're really saying. Well, I, uh, yes, although I think some of them, Mitch McConnell certainly does. I mean, M Mitch McConnell absolutely understands the importance of, of the debt ceiling, but that doesn't mean he's afraid to take a risk and roll the dice on it a little bit, uh, assuming that he's ultimately going to be able to uh, get it raised and still get what he wants in the budget. Okay, we'll be right back on this edition of the Dr. Kevin Show, the first Thursday of the month, Neutral News with Matt Connerton and Dr. Kevin. Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. The number one reason girls drop out of school in Sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Have you been searching for a perspective beyond the mainstream? Check it out. Join your hosts, Elito Pasquale and Diana Gold Holland, on Share International Radio for thought-provoking views behind the news. Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio. You can also find us at shareontheairradio.org. This may be the message of hope you've been waiting for. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer evening. It's everybody over for Sunday dinner and your family sleeping in their own beds at night. Making home affordable is a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Call 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Dr. Kevin Show. On this, the first Thursday of the month, which we call Neutral News Thursday, where Matt Connerton, new local celebrity in the Manchester, New Hampshire radio system, uh, with his own drive time. I want to call it a drive through show. You had to correct me several times when we weren't on air. Yeah, so, just, and, and, and some, some, some people call it a drive-by show, and it's like... Uh, no, it's just, you know, maybe in, in some uh, metropolitan areas you would call it that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. more likely a drive-by shooting, though, right? Um, so, okay, so we've talked about the debt ceiling and the fact that there's a lot of evidence that many people that have the authority to make the decision on it don't really understand what it is. Um, mm -hmm. What else do you have up your sleeve today for us, Matt? Wasn't it your turn, Dr. Kevin? No, it's your turn still. 
Um, oh. I, <laughs> I mean, I so, have something else, but I don't. I don't want to hog your show. No, go ahead. I'm 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 most I'm most content as I'm going going into the insanity of 14 days out of my big expo. <laughs> to yes, rely yes. on more of your brain cells than mine. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, I understand. I'm... So one of the reasons that I reached out to you earlier today, <laughs> I'm like, OK, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I am going to share with you and the listeners that two days ago, somebody decided to hip check a chair that my laptop was in. And my laptop bounced. Oh, and no. It has bounced before, and it's been okay. But this bounced to turn my screen into a Picasso. Um, oh and I was, no! Really? Yes. And I was on the road traveling, and I well, actually, it, it happened just before I was getting ready to go on the road and travel for the last day and a half. So I got back this afternoon oh. with a laptop that hadn't worked the whole time I was gone. Um, and oh, tomorrow that's frustrating. I, yeah, tomorrow I go to get another one. I'm trying to use a old one that I had left at the center. Um, and it's so out of date on everything that everything I hit is like either getting lost and blah and blah or blah and blah. So anyways, uh, so yes. So I am going to let you take the next topic. I, to be honest with you, I really wanted to get what the, what the news, what the, what the straight up news is with this whole recusing himself from the um, House Intelligence Committee that David Nunes did mm -hmm. um, was was I really wanted to find out I really wanted to look up and see how really was it just unethical or was it unethical and illegal for him to take evidence presented to him to the president when the president was part of the investigation but I I will be very honest I did not get enough to research this so I would be speaking more of what I had seen flashing by on mainstream news and to say that I honestly researched it well and can speak that I'm only talking the facts. So I, I put that out there. Uh, I think that that's a great topic to really look at of what the hell was that about? Let um, me, you know what, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll say something about that just briefly, if, if you'd like. I, I, uh, I heard someone else and I wish I could recall who said this, uh, but I heard someone else sum it up this way. It appears that he went to the White House, obtained some evidence, and then left and went back to the White House and said, hey, look what I found. And that seems to be what, 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 uh, what he did. But I probably shouldn't say anything more than that about that because we want to stick to facts and my own opinions are going to, and, and speculations are going to uh, come tumbling in. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I heard someone you know. kind of sum it up that way, and, and it does appear that that's what happened. So the <laughs> facts that we do know is that he made not one but two appearances at the White House. At one point, it was to acquire information, and at one point, it was to disseminate it. Um, and <laughs> um, then we do know that he talk to the president about an investigation that the president was included in. Is that not a fact? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so <sighs> is, is that what I don't know is, is that just unethical or is that actually illegal? I mean, is, is, is there, is there something about being the head of an investigative committee about Senate investigating the president, is there something illegal about going to the person being investigated to give them the information before you give it to your own team? Like you should ever give the information. I mean, I thought an investigation was about, you know, like, and, and of course the word transparency um, is like, you know, the film that you would take out of a foggy day in LA transparency. Um, or I should say a smoggy day in L.A. because there's certainly not none, n nothing that looks like transparency going on here. Um, based so on, what no... I've, uh, on what I've, I was going to say, based on what I've seen, I don't, I don't think there's anything illegal about what he did. Um, but, but it, it's enough that yes, he, he certainly uh, had to recuse himself. Um, he took his time in doing so, but I think it's, it's the correct thing to do because here's the thing. Um, I think uh, perhaps we can all agree, and I don't. I, I mean, I think I, I think I can say this fairly objectively and neutrally that 
even if there is the appearance of impropriety, uh, whether whether you truly believe that you did nothing wrong, whether he truly believes he did nothing wrong, if there's the imp- appearance of impropriety, you should recuse yourself in order for the committee uh, to be able to proceed with their investigation uh, in good faith. So I think it was regardless of what he may or may not have done. I think it was absolutely the correct decision uh, for him to do so. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's very hard to, to say to the American people, trust us that we're going to investigate this fully and then pull a stunt like that. Right. I mean, you set yourself up. You set yourself up that even if, and I'm not saying one way or the other, even if Trump is innocent, that action makes him look guilty. That a member of his own party in a leading committee went with him to information before following the proper procedures. Because we know that a fact Mm -hmm. is he did not follow the proper procedures. Mm -hmm. That's a fact, right? Right. It may not be illegal, but... But there is a fact he did not follow proper procedures and he went to a person being investigated and shared information that he had not shared with the team that was investigating them, Um, which, you know, smacks all over of impropriety. And so if there is nothing there, that would have been the worst thing to do. He should have brought it right to the committee like a, you know, like a rooster at dawn crowing, look what I found. And we've got something here and this is great and this is fabulous. And let's go on air and announce it to the American people that, you know, Trump is our greatest president and he's done no wrong. Well, it's also it's also I mean, even even if, you know, you can even take the, uh, the impropriety out of it and just say, you know, too, it's a break in protocol. You know, protocol would suggest that uh, one would take that information to the committee first before approaching the president or the media. And he and he didn't do that. And that is uh, I mean, historically, you know, protocol is, of course, you take it to your committee first and make it available there. Um, So that that is uh, strange, some strange behavior on his part. And the committee makes its makes its findings known to Congress first to its own house or its own the, the Senate or whatever depending on the committee I mean right. yeah you know, they jump two or three steps there you yeah. know which yeah. in of itself is saying there's something rotten in Denmark because you wouldn't do that <laughs> okay um, yeah. and again I'm, I'm not trying to go away from the idea of neutral news, but I am stating facts that are confusing to me, but I'm stating the facts. Right. Of what we know, what we know happened. So what else did you have up your sleeve? You said you had something, you did have some one more thing up your sleeve tonight. Yeah, there's another uh, thing that's that's interesting. And, you know, when when people are discussing these political issues, you know, as we discussed with the debt ceiling, when you don't know enough about something, um, you know, it, it's easy to to form certain opinions without knowing all the facts, and that's why facts and information are so important. So just as with the debt ceiling, people may not be aware of the consequences, um, the border wall uh, that uh, that our president has proposed uh, has potential consequences that uh, people may not have considered. Um, this is, um, in order in order to build this, uh, there is going to be a lot of eminent domain required because uh, along that border, on the American side, you have a lot of landowners and, and you know people who own farms and such, and, and there's there's a lot of land there. And historically, because you know obviously we do have some border wall, we have some border fencing already up. Um, but what I think people don't necessarily consider is if you are opposed to eminent domain and for, for people who don't know, um, and it is a polarizing uh, practice, but eminent domain is where the government comes along and says, you know, we're going to take your land or part of your land 
uh, because we need it for the public good. We need to put a road here or build a bridge or whatever it may be. But we're going to take part of that land. We're going to pay you for it. But we're good. And, you know, whether or not you get fair market value, mm, remember, you're dealing with uh, the government. But we're going to take that land from you uh, forcibly. We're not going to give you a choice. But we are going to pay you for it. And if you are opposed to eminent domain, as many people are, uh, because people believe, you know, will tend to believe in, you know, land rights and whatnot, but you are pro border wall, then you, you know, these two concepts are diametrically opposed because there's going to be a lot of eminent domain going on. And, uh, and I found something interesting. Uh, TheBlaze.com, which, of course, is a conservative website run by Glenn Beck. So, you know, people of that ilk tend to be very pro-border wall. But I found an old article from 2012, and it's interesting how history repeats. And this article, uh, Billy Hallowell wrote this. The title is, Landowners Along U.S.-Mexico Border Claim Government is Abusing Its Power to Take Land at Unfair Prices. So back in 2012, uh, people were complaining about this, obviously very much pre-Trump. Uh, but, but what's been going on is, um, you know, as I, I read this earlier, but and I know we're coming up on another break, but and some of these landowners the have been getting stiff. <laughs> you can finish about the stiff landowners when we get back. <laughs> All right. your soul with waves of consciousness on ohm times radio host your show on iom fm the radio network of ohm times media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of ohm times hosting a show on iom fm immediately connects you with our extensive dedicated community arrows evolution is where sexuality and spirituality meets. Join me, clinical sexologist Martha Tara Lee, on Eros Evolution on Thursdays, 4 p.m. Eastern, on On Times Radio. Every two minutes, an American is sexually assaulted. The majority of victims know their attacker. It could be your friend, your neighbor, or someone you met at a party. If you said no, it's rape, and it's a crime. This is Christina Ricci with RAIN. Call the National Sexual Assault Hotline today at 1-800-656-HOPE or visit RAIN.org. That's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Hello, 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 and welcome back. To the Dr. Kevin Show, where we challenge everything and everyone here on Ohm Times Radio, where we're changing the world one ohm at a time. This is the first Thursday of the month, and every first Thursday of the month, Matt Connerton from Matt Connerton Unleashed joins me when we do what we call the neutral news, trying to present just the facts. Uh, Matt was talking about eminent domain and the border wall, and is there... Uh, is is there a paradox going on between those that want to keep the Mexicans out and those that don't want to give up their land housed in the same body? So what else were you saying about that, Matt? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, when, when people don't know all the facts about a particular issue, you know, they, they don't always consider the consequences. Um, uh, according to the Daily Beast, uh, in 2006, or no, I'm sorry, it was actually uh, 2003 when uh, Congress uh, passed the um, the Border Fence Act. I'm sorry, the Secure Fence Act, rather. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was 2006. Congress passed the Secure Fence Act calling for no less than 700 miles uh, to be constructed on vulnerable points of the nearly 2,000-mile U.S.-Mexican border. 
uh, completed segments of that project plus natural boundaries could reasonably make it so only 1,000 miles of actual wall building is necessary. So that's interesting because, you know, um, and Trump himself has acknowledged that uh, that 2,000-mile border, we don't necessarily need 2,000 miles of wall because, uh, in fact, actually, he's saying now only 1,000 miles. I mean, these are rough estimates, obviously, but, you know, 700 miles, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this, 700 miles of fencing has already been done, was done during the George W. Bush administration, and there's also uh, many places along our border where you have a, a, a natural border, where you have cliffs and whatnot, where, where uh, people are not crossing from Mexico because it would be very difficult and dangerous to do so. Um, but uh, let's see. It says here, and this is from the Daily Beast article, it says, in carrying out Congress's 2006 wall construction mandate, the Department of Homeland Security hit a snag. Real estate issues were causing significant delay, according to its inspector general, um, and uh, the Government Accountability Office reports that, quote, federal and tribal lands make up 632 miles, or approximately 33% of the nearly 2,000 total border miles. And the remaining 66% is private and state-owned lands, which constitute the remaining 67% uh, of the border, most of which is located in Texas. So, so again, it's not as simple as just saying, well, we're going to build a border wall here. Um, that takes up space. You have to you have to take up a lot of land. And you know, if it's federal land, in theory, there's no issue there. Where there's federal land, you go and you build your wall. But where there's tribal lands, now we all know the problems you run into there. Uh, uh, building uh, building anything on land that is that is tribal land. Um, that that uh, you know that Native Americans uh, continue to enjoy uh, sovereign control over. So that gets very very sticky. Look what happened with the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and then you've got private and state-owned land. So where you have private land, again, you have to go. If you're the government, you have to go and buy that land from these people. And the going rate, uh, from what I've read, is usually around 25 percent of value. So that's why I said. You know, these landowners get stiff. I mean, you know, if you've got property that's worth a hundred grand and the government comes along and says, We're gonna give you twenty five thousand dollars for that, you know, you're gonna you're gonna feel like you've been abused. Um so uh this is the other the other consequence of this is um this results in lawsuits. Because now you have people suing the government. You've got landowners suing the government. You might even have a state suing the government if that state doesn't want to give up some of their state-owned land for some reason or feels that the federal government is taking advantage of them. And when you have lawsuits, which the government uh, typically wins in the end because, you know, you're, you're suing the government, but you have to use the government to sue the government. You have to use the judicial branch of the government. So, so the, the game is rigged to begin with, right? But that does have the effect of slowing this down. So now, if you say, okay, we're going to build this wall and we're going to get it done quickly and efficiently, you can't get it done quickly and efficiently because you have all these landowners suing you and slowing it down. And, again, these are, these are real-world consequences that uh, – Perhaps not everyone realizes, and, and again, these are just facts. Uh, this is how this is how it works. And there's also too, when it comes to eminent domain, historically there has been sort of an ideological struggle about eminent domain itself, which is, is it appropriate uh, to use eminent domain for uh, private, uh, uh, you know, commercial use? In other words, can you take someone's land? to build a shopping mall as opposed to just building a government road or whatnot. Now, obviously, in this case, that part of it doesn't come into play. This is specifically for the government. Um, but it does. It, it is something that makes eminent domain, uh, because of the, uh, the controversy of it, um, it probably does help to, you know, if someone is suing the government and they want to make the case that, well, the government uses eminent domain in an abusive way, here are some examples. 
Um, you would certainly, in your argument, include, include examples of uh, perhaps where uh, the government has taken someone's land to build a shopping mall or a car wash or something where you go, well, wait a minute, eminent domain uh, is supposed to be uh, for for uh, for the government, you know, for, for the public good <laughs> as deemed by the government, not for commercial purposes. So it gets very, very complicated. And, uh, and it will be interesting to see if the border wall goes forward, how that part of it plays out. Because as I said, a lot of people, ideologically speaking, uh, conservatives who would tend to be very pro-border wall are also very pro-land rights, which means they don't want the federal government coming in and taking their land, controlling their land in any way, um, you know, messing with the, the, the cattle ranchers uh, out west, etc. You know, that all gets very complicated um, when it comes to land rights. Uh, they want the government to leave them alone when it comes to land rights. But the government can't leave you alone when it comes to land rights if you've got land on that border and they need your land for their big wall. So I just think it's a fascinating. It's going to be very fascinating to see this play out. Okay. So in the two minutes we have left, um, you know, how many, how many facts do you have available for this going nuclear option that's happening with getting in the Supreme Court justice? Have you followed well, that? Well, I know they want, make, uh, they want to make a little bit. I mean, that's, that's a story that's kind of played out over today, and I haven't, um, I haven't been paying attention too much to that specifically. But... Uh, I, I will be I will say this. I mean, I will be surprised if ultimately uh, Gorsuch is not uh, confirmed. I, I do believe he will be confirmed, certainly. Um, and I do think the Republicans, uh, you know, McConnell certainly willing to do uh, whatever they feel is necessary. And if they have to shut down any possibility of the Democrats filibustering it, they will. Um, but that always gets. That gets tricky for either side in the long run because, uh, well, it just does politically because then whoever is in control has to deal with, uh, whoever's in the minority, I should say, then has to deal with the consequences of what they did when they were in the majority. <laughs> so historically, messing with filibuster rules can have some unpleasant consequences in the long term. Uh, and by the way, uh, just a side note about that, I wish – that they would not use the phrase nuclear option uh, when when discussing this. Uh, it, it gives me the creeps. But they do. That's become the parlance over the last decade. Yes, the nuclear option. Well, um, uh, from, from what little I know, and I'm not pretending because those were my two stories that I was most interested in trying to investigate had I had the ability to do so, and was not caught in yes. the seventh layer of technology hell. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the one of the things was is that changing this basically, you know, the whole I, original idea was that you would have to get people from both parties at sixty percent of the vote to vote something in. And that you would not be able to um, just have in a simple majority saying whatever party rules can put it in over who they want, whether it's, a, a, you know, a, whether it is a representation of the whole United States and not who's in power for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and what concerns me is that this swings that we're going to just continue to feed the schism. Now, I have not investigated the Supreme Court justice enough. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how much of what they're saying is true and how much is hype. I know that, you know, the Republicans managed to um, stop somebody from going in um, to go up to, to be considered because they were saying that it was a Mer lame duck president. But Merrick Garland, yep, they, they wouldn't even give him a hearing. They wouldn't even give him a hearing. Um, and that in of itself was inexcusable. 
Um, I'm sorry. It just is. It's inex it's inexcusable. You stopped doing government for a year in hopes you would win the election. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, that they really is, rolled the dice on that, too. Yeah. And that is a real infantile and real infantile thing. Now, are the Democrats being equally infantile by not approving this guy because he really shouldn't be approved because he's not a voice? I mean, Scalia was a conservative. If they replace right. him with a conservative, is it really destroying the court? I don't know. Garland was a centralist. He was not a raving liberal or conservative. But mm -hmm. Matt, thank you so much. Dr. Kevin, thank you.